Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> your MC for yesterday, today, and tomorrow, Miss Gemma, Gemma, Gemma. Thank you. Thank you, Miles, for that once again quite detailed and complex introduction. Um, Hello, everybody. There's some faces here from yesterday, which I'm assuming means you're here for the whole weekend. Fantastic. Also, some new faces. So there's a bit of housekeeping. It is rather boring, but it is really important. The first thing is, the barge in are being amazing to us and hosting us and looking after us so well. But if you park your car in the main car park, please, 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 could you park it in the overflow? Because they're really worried that if the car park is full, they won't get any passing trade. People come in, take one look, and, and go away again. And I completely understand that. So the overflow car park is straight down to the bottom of the campsite. There's a gap in the hedge. Go through that. There are more camper vans and cars, and you can put your cars in that field. And the pub are really stressing that, that we do that as a mark of respect to them for hosting this event here, because it's the first time we've been here, and we'd like to come back. So if, if your car's out there, put it down there. It's just a couple of minutes walk, not even that, 30 seconds. Fire exits there and there. If you haven't already done so, please order your lunch at the bar and pay for it and give your name to the lovely Emma, who's behind the bar. Emma, give us a wave. She's bent down, I don't know where she's doing. Know what she, there she is, lovely Emma. She was brilliant yesterday. So that's lunches, toilets, fire exits, and cars. At lunchtime, it was lovely yesterday, and everyone took their lunches outside. They'll bring them out to you and shout your name, but I think the weather might not hold. So what we're going to have to do when we break for lunch is everybody out for five minutes while we pull the tables across so everyone can have lunch in the warm and dry, because we won't offer it in the restaurant. So that's it, boring stuff out of the way. First speaker of the day. We had an amazing time yesterday. We had some mind-blowing presentations. There was a lots of interesting conversations and new friendships being made in the breaks, which is what this event is all about in these crazy times much needed. And today's going to be no different, I'm sure. And I'm delighted to welcome someone who I've been um, associated with on the alternative scene for years. Dave Hodrian, long-time UFO researcher, founder of the Birmingham UFO Group, who you may have even seen some of his presentations online. Long-time conference speaker, great presenter, and he's going to present some new information today about contact experiences. So I'm delighted to welcome Dave. He's the first speaker of the day. Let's get some energy going. Big round of applause for Dave Hodgin. Good morning, bases. Hello, everybody. Uh, lovely to be here. Uh, I've, I've spoken at bases a number of years ago, and it's absolutely great to be back. Uh, this is my first time here at the, uh, the, at the barge. Uh, absolutely lovely venue, and uh, it's, it's great to be the first speaker of the day. Um, so, as our host uh, pointed out, I've looked into uh, the subject of UFOs now for 14 years. And as part of that, I've dealt with uh, literally over a thousand UFO sightings, uh, but also hundreds of contact cases around the world. And by contact, I mean uh, alien abduction, alien visitation, etc. Now, many of you here will uh, be very familiar uh, with, the, uh, with the contact subject. But today, I'm focusing specifically on a very, very um, a particular aspect of the subject that shows itself on, re on repeated occasions. And that's called uh, screen memories. And, my, uh, and it's always been a fascinating part of the contact phenomena to me, so I decided to build this in-depth uh, talk to take you through it all. So let's have a look at what we've got ahead. 
So uh, first of all, we're going to go over uh, a brief overview on what we mean by screen memories, uh, what, what's it all about. Then I'll talk about the different types of screen memory that can occur. Uh, there'll be a long section with uh, lots of different case examples. I'd like to show you the actual real cases, uh, cases that I've directly investigated and, and how that fits in with the subject. Uh, there'll be some possible explanations, and then to finish off, there'll be some conclusions that have uh, vanished off the bottom of the page, a few conclusions at the end. And I've got a couple of uh, special uh, extra bits towards the end of the talk as well, uh, something different to look forward to there, uh, but uh, no spoilers. So let's have a look. Screen memories and overview. So what are screen memories? So the official scientific explanation for screen memories is this. A, a, a dive, oh, it's come up on my screen. A distorted memory, uh, generally of a visual rather than verbal nature. The falsified memory is the first that we become aware of. The essential elements of an experience are represented in memory by the inessential elements of the same experience. So that's from that paper there. So um, what, what we mean by that is that there's no, gen, in general, no guarantee of the data produced by our memory. Now think about that for a minute. Isn't that fascinating? It means that things you may think have existed earlier in your life or things that you remember might not actually be entirely what actually happened. So screen memories are thought to be a blend of two different things, a repression and transference. So repression is the unconscious exclusion of difficult or unacceptable memories impulses, desires, or thoughts from our consciousness. And transference is the transfer of feelings regarding something onto something else, from one object onto a different object or different thing. And screen memories have ser sometimes served as a source for artistic impression. This is uh, Lewis Carroll's, uh, uh, made to represent Lewis Carroll's uh, famous novel, Alice in Wonderland, uh, and that had uh, aspects of screen memories uh, in them. Uh, lovely little animated gif there as it goes. Yeah, I did notice after putting it in, this in the talk, the uh, similarity between those mushroom houses and UFOs. Actually, yeah. <laughs> so how does, this relate, how does this all relate to contact? Well, individuals have experienced contact. Uh, they sometimes recall visual aspects of the experience incorrectly. Uh, when, when they're talking back about what happened to them, what they remember, sometimes it's obvious to researchers that that's not exactly what took place. Uh, so the appearance of the beings, uh, the exterior of craft that are seen in the sky, uh, or the interiors of craft uh, when people are abducted or taken aboard craft, or sometimes step voluntary aboard them for people who don't like the, uh, the term abduction because uh, of its negative connotations, um, they can all be masked in various ways in certain circumstances. So it doesn't always occur. I've dealt with many, many contact cases where there's no aspect of, of screen memories uh, within them. But there's also quite a lot where there is. So it appears to be more prevalent in childhood. So in a lot of cases where somebody's had repeated experiences through their life, sometimes they may remember screen memories occurring in their early memories, and then later on they see uh, the actual experience of what's going on. Uh, and it can sometimes occur for a period of time before ceasing. So they may potentially have contact for years, and then all of a sudden there'll be a period where they get the screen memory type things show up, and then it'll vanish again later on. Um, and uh, sometimes they can also be referred to as overlays or stealth encounters. So if you've heard anybody mention that in the subject of UFOs, or perhaps you personally uh, describe this phenomenon as that, as opposed to screen memories, I'm talking about all the same thing here. So what are the different types of screen memories that can occur? Let's take it at quite a high level. So first of all, the beings. Now you'll see here, I've said ET, okay? Now, I don't want to push my own personal viewpoints onto any of you. You may have your particular uh, views on the subject. There's many, many unanswered questions. Um, my personal belief, after looking into it for so long, uh, is that we're dealing with um, multiple different advanced intelligences that are probably, I would say probably, of an extraterrestrial origin, although um, other non-human explanations may also, uh, may also be correct. Uh, but I call them ETs just for short, but that doesn't necessarily mean that 100,000% they're definitely ET, okay? Uh, so what can the ETs show up as? Uh, they can appear as animals of different kinds. Uh, they can appear as doctors or surgeons, so a human now. They can appear as pilots. Uh, they can appear as fictional characters, such as cartoon characters and things like that. Uh, they can appear as a figure of authority, such as a police officer or a fireman or something like that. They can appear as clowns or carnival staff. Uh, they can sometimes appear as, as somebody completely recognisable to the individual, somebody personal to them, such as a family member. 
Uh, and they can also appear as silhouettes. What do I mean by that? Well, we'll find out later in the talk. So uh, let's have a look at the uh, craft screen memories that can occur. There's a lovely picture of you, further. Uh, so they can first appear, appear as helicopters, so people can remember them as helicopters, uh, or aeroplanes of different kinds. Uh, they can also sometimes remember them as ground vehicles, strangely, like a lorry or something like that. Uh, now, inside the craft, where people are taken aboard for, um, in an abduction, etc., uh, they can uh, sometimes feel that they're inside a hospital or, sur or doctor's surgery, and they can see it all like that, including human, uh, human doctors and nurses around them. Uh, and sometimes it can be familiar surroundings, such as their own home or somewhere else recognisable to them. So, how do we break past this? Well, there is a way of breaking past it, and it's through hypnotic regression, which uh, some of you will have heard of. Uh, that's sometimes used as a way of exploring contact experiences. Now, it's very, very controversial, and it's scientifically validated that you can implant false memories through hypnotic regression. But uh, I've sat in on many regressions over the years, and the, um, the, the regressionists are very careful to not do that, to not lead the person, so it comes from them. They're just kind of, what happened next, what happened next? And sometimes, under an induced uh, regressive state, the individual can relive the experience in a lot more depth, and they can come out with details that they can't remember consciously and retrieve these lost memories. And when a screen memory is involved, they can sometimes fully or partially see past it, and they, they kind of realise that the, the being or the surroundings, that it's a mask, that it's not actually what it is, and they'll break past that under hypnosis. And this was referenced in the abduction-themed uh, horror movie, The Fourth Kind, which uh, some of you may have seen. Uh, in, in this, uh, the, uh, the individuals involved kept seeing owls, or owls with kind of larger black eyes and everything. And under, under regression, they then saw them for what they actually were, alien beings. Um, quite a scary film, but uh, also observant on a lot of the aspects that fit in with the contact subject. So let's have a look at animals, first of all. Now going to go into the different types in more depth. So, yeah, the ETs, uh, I, I say primarily the greys. Uh, many of you know what I mean by that. Uh, so our, our usual friends are right there on the, uh, on the, actual, um, on the actual banner. Uh, so the, uh, the small, usually small little guys, uh, big black eyes, uh, oversized uh, heads, usually completely hairless. Um, and uh, primarily, they're the ones that tend to do this uh, screen memory um, thing, from, from what I can see. When the, when, the real, when, the, when the real being is seen later on, either through regression or later on through flashbacks, it's almost usually the, uh, the greys. I won't say always, but usually. And they'll sometimes appear in the form of a known Earth animal. So owls are quite commonly reported, which is why they were referenced in the film The Fourth Kind. And I've dealt with some cases, which you'll see in just a minute. Uh, so there's many other animals can also appear, uh, including wolves, dogs, cats, deer, rabbits, and insects. And that's just some of them. There's, uh, there's, there's many. Uh, the animal may appear unusual in some way. Uh, so what I mean by that is that it might not always be as it appears in real life. So they might see a mouse, but it might be absolutely ginormous in size, like a four-foot-high mouse or something like that. And sometimes they can be recognisable to the individual. So it might be their own family pet, for example, their own pet dog or cat. So let's have a look at an actual case. This is an early case that I dealt with uh, from the Birmingham area, uh, from Erdington. It's a repeat contact case, but, and by that I mean that the lady's had repeated experience uh, throughout her life. And I investigated back in 2011. Uh, lady's name is Rachel. Any names I give in this, by the way, have been freely... Uh, uh, the, the witnesses have allowed me to release their name. If I don't mention her name, it probably means that they haven't. Uh, so she lives in Erdington, an area of Birmingham, and uh, she actually predicted uh, me showing up and Birmingham UFO Group getting involved in her experiences. And this is really fascinating. She actually had a piece of paper that she'd, uh, she claimed to have had for a number of years, and it had Bufog written on it. And she didn't re when I spoke with her initially, I said, I'm from Birmingham UFO Group, so she didn't see the, uh, the link there. Uh, but later on, when I was speaking with her, I, I, I said, uh, I'm from Boothfog instead for short. And she was like, oh, my God. And I was like, what? And she goes and gets this piece of paper out. She said she'd written it about a couple of years before, and she'd written the word Boothfog. She had no idea what it meant at the time. It was a premonition that I'd be getting involved in the case, or what I believe. Um, many contactees' experiences can have uh, psychic-type phenomena can occur uh, with them, and premonitions are very, very uh, common. 
So anyway, back to screen memories. So she had repeated childhood memories uh, of, of this white owl, and she'd see the face of the owl like that, just staring right into her face. And she'd usually get it just when she was dropping off to sleep. So she'd lay down in bed, she closed her eyes, and then all of a sudden there's this flash, and she can see this owl staring at her. And then it's, uh, as I say, it would occur just before she dropped off to sleep. And that's very likely to have been visitation or abduction related. And we know this through repeat cases where exactly the same thing has been reported. And the fact that she'd had other experiences later on where she recalled seeing the actual beings. And we'll get into why she may have seen them as a child and then not later on uh, in a bit. So I'll always come back to things. So uh, here's another case here. This is from West Scotland. And it involves a, a mother and her two daughters. And uh, back in 2004, uh, her daughters, they, were, they, they used to play with these Sylvanian family toys, which some of you will be familiar with. There's a uh, family up there, there's a little family of, uh, of owls, aren't they cute? But on repeated occasions, uh, the, uh, the daughters, they remember seeing full-sized versions of these Sylvanian family owls in their bedroom. Um, so they were kind of owl-sized, owl you know, sort of about a foot high or whatever. And they'd sit on top of the wardrobe and then basically just fly across the room to her uh, towards the face. And then at that moment, there'd be a blackout and they wouldn't remember anything else. And it's, um, it's, it's very likely that these were the starts of, of experiences and potentially abducted after that point, but the memory's been blocked out. That moves into the missing time phenomena, another aspect that shows up again and again with contact. But I'm focusing on screen memories here. I could do an entire separate talk on missing time. Here's another case of wolves this time. This is a repeat contact case from Rednall, again in the outskirts of Birmingham. Obviously, a lot of the cases I've dealt with have been from around the Birmingham area because Birmingham UFO group. I've even dealt with some cases from Birmingham, Alabama, believe it or not, where people contacted me thinking we were the uh, American uh, Alabama. Uh, and, but I have dealt with cases as far wide as Australia, and you'll see some of those uh, international cases later on. So in this, the, uh, the gentleman involved, he had this recurring ni uh, nightmare. Again, it was in his childhood years. And he'd be walking through his local park, be on his own, and all of a sudden, ahead of him, he'd see this pack of wolves would kind of walk out for, through the trees, and they'd start to run towards him, and obviously he'd be very frightened of that. So he tried to get away, but uh, the, he tried to get away, but his legs wouldn't work right, and he was just running a lot slower than he would usually, and the wolves would catch him up. And at that point, the dream would end, bang, it, just, it, it would just finish. And later on, the wolves actually uh, became something else. So the dream remained, but the wolves changed into something. And we'll, we'll get to that later in the talk. So I remember for that one for later. One last case here with animals. Uh, this is a very interesting case. It's from Southampton. Uh, it involves a lady named Tina. I've actually given a number of talks alongside Tina at various places. Some of you may have, uh, have seen those talks. And she's, uh, she had a number of uh, abductions in late 2002. She's had them since as well. But she had a period of, uh, of, uh, where she'd have numerous contact experiences uh, following on one from another, which often happens. And this is a very strange experience. Uh, in this, she found herself hanging below some sort of long conveyor belt uh, type contraption. And there were lots of people there uh, forward and behind her, almost like a production line of humans. And everybody else was in a trance-like state except for her. So they had their eyes open, they're staring, but they weren't act acting like they were awake. And she was looking around. There was, a, there was numerous uh, beings seen and a very bright light shining into her eyes initially. And as she moved along this production line, she came to this area that looked almost like a kind of control station bit with some uh, panels and buttons on. And there were lots of greys there grouped together. Uh, some of them were very tall and other ones were quite short. It was almost like the taller ones were teaching the, li the little ones. Um, now, there's one particular one in the middle that seemed to have a sort of darker skin. And uh, it seemed to notice she was awake. It looked directly at her and she realised it knew she was awake. And it seemed to be very angry, or seemingly very angry at this. And it ran directly towards her, jumped up, and tapped her on the forehead. And at that moment, she gets this image of a spider in her mind to try to draw it there. So there's this flash of light, and then all she sees is this spider. And that's it. That's the end of her experience. Blackout. Doesn't remember anything else from it. So again, we'll come back to that later on. So we're going to move now on to hospitals and doctors. <laughs> so yeah, the beings will sometimes appear as these uh, human doctors or surgeons. Uh, and also the craft interior 
um, that's, that's remembered during an abduction experience. They may remember seeing the, uh, the outside of it as a, as a hospital or surgery. Now, usually the, this, this would be uh, with, the being, uh, with the beings disguised as human doctors as well at the same time. So the whole scene is like they're lying in a hospital bed, but they, but they have no recollection of ever being at hospital or anything. And there's numerous possible reasons for why this is occurring. Again, we're going to come back to that. So here's a, uh, a stunning case that I dealt with uh, from Droitwich back in 2011. So a repeat contact uh, case involves a lady named Jenny. And uh, she had uh, two uh, trigger abduction experiences. What do I mean by that? So a trigger experience is where the individual has a certain experience that is, is so powerful to them, it means so much to them, that they realise that something very strange is going on in their life. Now, she'd had experiences right back to childhood, but as many people do and have these experiences, they push them to the back of their head because they're too way out, they're too different to their normal life to comprehend. So rather than look into that in depth and entertain it as a real thing, they'll just put it away and it's back there. It's something that's happened to them. But in, in 2011, she had these two experiences within a period of a week and uh, there, were two, uh, th there was too much went on with them. She knew something had taken place. Now, with the second experience, the second abduction experience, she found herself in this very strange room, and uh, it reminded her of a doctor's surgery. She's tried to draw it here. Um, so there were some double doors. That's a double. Do I can, there we go. There's a double doors at the back. We've got the, there was this strange wood panelling all over the walls. She said it was very, very clinical type environment. This is her lying down as a stick figure, and she's lying down on a flattened bench. She was naked, but she had a, a thin sheet draped across her, and uh, there was this presence of some being up here by her shoulder. Uh, she sensed it behind her, but she was uh, mostly paralysed, so she couldn't look round to see the being, but she knew it was standing there. And that being was also seen in the previous experience. You got a direct link there with the two abduction accounts. Now, interestingly, there was this little chap next to her. So she's lying down and clothed, and there's this small doctor guy alongside her. He's got her spectacles on. He's got uh, short, very short red hair. A little chap, about four foot high, wearing a normal uh, doctor's kind of white, uh, white coat. And um, what he does, he reaches out. Oh, there's the other, the other being I mentioned there. So he reaches out above her, and he holds his hands a short distance above her body. He doesn't touch her, but he moves his hands down over her, and she starts hearing him speak to her telepathically in her mind, telling her of different ailments that she's had. So he kind of moved down and said, I oh, used to have a stomach ulcer a number of years ago, but it's no longer there, and this sort of thing. And she was very frightened. It was going to say something bad to her, like, you know, like you've got cancer or something like that. But in response to that, in response to her thinking that, she hears a voice in her head telling, telling her, don't worry, you don't have cancer. So the being could hear what she was thinking and then directly responded to that. And that's very, very common that these beings talk telepathically. Uh, multiple types generally talk telepathically. Uh, so uh, I took a regression hypnotherapist around to Jenny's house. We performed a number of uh, very deep regressions uh, on her, and they were successful. And here now is part uh, uh, of the actual regression transcripts talking about this experience. Let me read through it. There's a man. A man? Yeah, on my right side. He's very pale. He has short red hair. What about the shape of his face? It doesn't seem real. His face doesn't seem right. What makes you tell me that his face doesn't seem real? It's like it wants to fall off. And his arms? What about his arms? They look like normal human hands, but they change while I'm watching what he's doing. You observe his hands change from normal looking hands to just something with three fingers. Normal fingers? No, they seem to be pointed. So there's a great example there of somebody under regression seeing past this screen memory that the being's put on, it wants to show itself as a doctor. Under, in her conscious memory, she remembered this, and she remembered him as a doctor. And when we regressed her, this is what came out. Absolutely fascinating. It's another case, uh, another example of doctors. This one's from Belina in New South Wales, and it involves this mother and two daughters. Not the same case as before, I might ask. Uh, you'd probably gather that by the location. So the eldest daughter, at uh, a point in her life, she started to get these uh, nosebleeds, regular nosebleeds, a common after effect of contact. Uh, but um, obviously I'm not saying everybody's had nosebleeds as a kid, as a, you know, as an abductee or anything like that. But she started to mention to her mother uh, that these doctors would come for her, come into her bedroom at night. And uh, obviously 
deeply disturbed her mother. And the mother asked, you know, what do these guys look like? What do these little doctors look like? And she couldn't actually remember what they looked like. She just called them doctors. So it's interesting, that. And it actually has uh, similarities to the famous uh, film on the the American case of Whitley Stryver. So uh, Whitley's son and Whitley both saw these uh, little beings, and they called them the little blue doctors. And uh, Whitley thought that he was alone in having these experiences. And when he spoke with his son, his son started mentioning the same. And when they talked about them, they realized that their their descriptions of these short beings uh, married up. And that was uh, one of the reasons why Whitley uh, was, was convinced he was having real experiences. Obviously a stunning case. So let's, uh, let's move on to aircraft and pilots next. Up, up and away. So yeah, in cases where a craft is seen, up, up in the sky for example, or landed, uh, the individual can recall seeing it as a normal looking aircraft or helicopter. Obviously if it's landed it would usually be a, a helicopter, although technically a plane could also land I, I suppose. Um, in the cases I've dealt with involving landed craft, it's almost always helicopters. Uh, so, yeah, and also, if direct contact occurs, let's say beings come out, uh, the person can sometimes recall seeing them as, uh, as pilots, straight up pilots of helicopters, pilots of planes, ex- exactly like you'd, you'd expect. Although not always. In some instances, the aircraft itself, all the pilots seen, are old-fashioned, like, from, like they might see a, an old biplane from back in the Second World War, or they may see, uh, you know, just a, a classic old, old pilot like that, like that picture there. Uh, it seems kind of out of sync with the, with the actual time that they're having the experience. And it's, it's almost like the beings don't realise that, that them just showing themselves in that manner. Uh, again, I, I told you earlier on, some things are sometimes off with this. and don't seem quite right. So here's another absolutely stunning case. This is uh, one from Bista. Again, the gentleman involved, David Hunt, is a musician, and I've, uh, I've spoken numerous times around the country uh, with him. It's one of the biggest contact cases I've ever dealt with. The case report is about 150 pages long. Uh, and uh, by the way, all the, uh, the reports for all these cases that I'm going through, they're all available on the Bufo website. So if you're fascinated and you want to look more, uh, you can find them all on there. So at age eight, he used to live in Hillingdon, uh, the district of London. And he used to go and play at this uh, park. It was a, a nearby park. He uh, used to call it the Elephant Park because it had a, uh, uh, a climbing frame that was the shape of an elephant. And he, he'd go down to there. It was, uh, it was just off Windsor Avenue, still there today. And he'd go down there with his friend. Large area of grass in this playground. There he goes. This is his witness drawing. Down the bottom, you can see some swings and a uh, roundabout, I guess. And uh, what happened? There was down there and nobody else in the park. This is broad daylight. This isn't after dark. Or anything. It was just daylight. Uh, but there wasn't anybody else around. Uh, and all of a sudden, this strange object flies in. They see it coming in across, across the sky. And this is really bizarre. Uh, and uh, David tried to draw what he remembers it looking like. He said it was a, a long cylindrical-shaped object. It had some weird sort of radars or kind of, um, appendages and things sticking out at the top end. Um, and it was also rotating in a clockwise direction, so he's drawn the arrows going around it there. So this thing came in, essentially landed like a rocket in front of them. The door opens... And out gets two pilots. They're wearing bomber jackets. They've got black shades on. They're obviously fascinated by what's going on with this. Not immediately scared. The, the men beckon them over. They walk across the grass and um, approach them. They get, they get right next to them. So the, uh, the gentlemen, they, uh, the, these pilots that come out, they, they invite them to come aboard this strange flying vehicle with them to go for a ride. And uh, David, uh, because he'd had previous experiences, previous contact experiences to this, he wasn't frightened by this. He was already starting to get um, used to, uh, to having uh, unusual experiences. But his friend, Matthew, was uh, uh, absolutely terrified of this. It was just really bizarre, uh, just the situation. And he, he was very frightened and said he didn't want to go. So in the end, uh, David said, OK, we won't, we won't go. So they, they turned the men down. And at this point, the pilots got back into this device and they watched the door close and they watched it take off in front of them. No flames or fumes or anything. It just lifted off, off the ground silently and flew away into the sky. Now, in the, in the, in the weeks following this experience, uh, David realised his friends started to clam up more. He wanted to talk with them a lot about what had happened. But when he started mentioning it, his friend would kind of shut down about it, didn't want to discuss it, was obviously quite disturbed by what had happened. And uh, in the end, they, uh, he moved away from the uh, London area with his family. 
Um, but a number of years later, I think it was about 10 or so years later, uh, David happened to uh, bump into the, uh, his, his old friend again. I don't know how that, exactly how that came about. But they had a conversation where they talked about this experience again. And at this point, he realized that his friend had different memories to him regarding what had happened. Uh, when he spoke with him, he found his friend remembered a helicopter landing and the two pilots getting out. So they both remember the pilots looking the same, but his friend recalled a helicopter. David, for whatever reason, saw the craft probably as it actually was. Uh, now, this may be because he had previous contact experiences, and perhaps his friend was just there alongside him as, a, uh, as an unwilling participant. And this is often the case you'll get with repeat cases. Sometimes there's other witnesses present that can get involved, but they're not the exact focus of the experience. Another one with helicopters here. This is a case in Swansea, and it involves this la lady named Kerry. Uh, and when, when she was a uh, child, uh, she used to live in Katanga in the Belgian Congo. Very interesting. And at age eight, back in 1955, uh, she, she got a Le Col de Sers primary school. And we talked quite a lot about that. But she recalled this particular memory um, where this helicopter had landed in a school playground and um, a pilot got out and uh, invited her aboard to go for a, uh, to go for a ride. And uh, the pilot happened to be one of her neighbours, who apparently in the area he would take people on little tours in, in a helicopter. So this seemed to sort of make sense to her. So she apparently got on this helicopter with him, and they took off from the school playground and flew around a bit. And she remembers being looking out of the window of the helicopter and seeing all the ground below, but she couldn't remember actually landing and getting back out of the helicopter, which is interesting. And uh, when she spoke with her mother, she wasn't particularly frightened about it. She was more excited, so she told her mother when she got home. <laughs> and you can imagine what, you know, what her mother thought to that. She's like, what? You know, the next door neighbor's gone, landed his helicopter at your school and picked you up, taking you a flight in the middle of the day. So she spoke to the neighbor, and the neighbor, of course, denied it happening because it doesn't make any logical sense whatsoever. He said, you know, I didn't, I didn't pick her up. Now, again, this lady, she, reg uh, she was regressed. And um, under regression, she saw, the bee, uh, she saw it as a grey stepping out of a silver-shaped saucer, a domed disc-shaped craft. Let's move on to fictional characters now. So sometimes these beings can appear in something that actually isn't even a, a real character in the, in, the, in the real world. So they sometimes appear as fictional characters, uh, and they're usually familiar to the contactee in a certain way. So it may be uh, potentially a character out of a book that they're reading uh, or something they've seen on television. Uh, and that can include storybook TV characters, it can include figures wearing recognisable outfits, such as, a, I don't know, a ninja or a pirate or something like that, uh, or cartoon characters. And again, this is, this is very, very much, this particular thing is more prevalent in childhood years. Uh, and it's not always friendly, so they might see it as some kind of monster or, or you know, horrible thing that they've seen that they're, they've seen that they're frightened of. Uh, this, uh, this particular thing was featured in uh, Steven Spielberg's stunning abduction TV series, uh, Taken. I don't know, have, uh, hands up, have you seen Taken? Some of you. Okay, if you haven't seen Taken, it's uh, without a doubt the best. Um, uh, it's, it's fictional, but it's very much focused on the contact phenomena, and it's absolutely stunning. It's a 10 part TV series. Uh, I've got a, uh, a, a quick screen grab out of it here. It works. There we go. <laughs> so, this is the end. This is right at the start of the second episode where uh, the, uh, the boy involved is a repeat contactee. He sees, uh, he's reading a book at the time with this cartoon squirrel in wearing blue, and uh, he actually sees it appear outside his room at night takes it across to the it's, uh, its tree in the background, its kind of tree house, and they get into it, and then the tree changes into a saucer, and it takes off with him in. Um, so that there's a, a great example. But let's have a look at a case I dealt with. It's an absolutely amazing case here. This one's from Australia. Uh, and it's a repeat case again, and I investigated right back in 2009, one of my first years investigating uh, the abduction phenomena. Uh, the man had had many experiences throughout his childhood, and they, they disturbed him quite a lot. And he wanted, but he wanted to explore some of his earliest memories uh, in, in his life. And it was uh, too expensive to travel across to the... Uh, you know, don't stare at that too much, by the way, guys. <laughs> uh, too expensive to travel to the UK, so he arranged for a regression across in Australia. And then, uh, essentially, uh, I got sent the transcript from that regression, the audio uh, dialogue from it. I transcribed it. Uh, which took a long period of time because it was quite a long regression. Let's have a look at a particular aspect out of this, dealing with one of his uh, early experiences. They just stuck a needle in my ear. Okay, okay, what was that for? Asked them why. A needle in my ear, stuck a needle in my ear. Who? 
Little guys with big round heads, they're happy and they're wearing red. Okay, this is crazy, this is crazy. So he was remembering these things under regression, but he didn't like it, he didn't like the, the, the memories that were coming through. Uh, how old are you? Going back to about three. Keep going, why did they do that? What was the reason? Because they care about me and they like me. They said this won't hurt and it did hurt. Okay, why were they sticking a needle in your ear? What was that about? It's DNA, it's not, it's not blood. What's it for? What's it going to do? They're checking me. That's what they're doing. We're just checking to see how you're doing. It won't hurt. It's okay. What did you do at school today? Ah, needle. It's a needle. So this is, the beings, this is him re recollecting the beings talking telepathically to him, trying to put his mind at ease, um, sort of asking what, what happened at school. It's very skinny. He's talking about the needle. Very little. Can't hardly see it. What you're doing this for? Oh, we're just checking you. We care about you, and we're just checking you. It's okay, we do this all the time. When all the time? Oh, when you're asleep. Uh, he's making himself look like Casper and Elmer Fudd. Why do they do that? Well, we're playing. You're playing games with them. I'm allowed to do that. Do they like that? Not sure. They don't want me to worry. <laughs> Elmer Fudd had me fooled. You know their eyes aren't always black. What other colours are they? I was looking at Elmer Fudd, and all of a sudden, it's a big head, and the eyes were down here. And they weren't covered in black. They were not like cartoon eyes, but they're hard to describe. They're absolutely fascinating there. So you can see in that regression, the, the beings were putting on the persona of Casper, the ghost, and Elmer Fudd. And you can see there from the pictures, the similarity between those two characters and, and, and what a grey might appear as. Very interesting indeed. Here's one involving a pirate of, of kinds. This is a case in Leeds, and it involves a gentleman named Simon, who I'm still in touch with today. And uh, from age three, he, Simon's not here, is he? No? Just checking. Uh, from age three, he began to experience uh, visitations uh, in, in, in his early childhood. Uh, by visitation, I mean it's when the being comes in a close proximity, usually in the person's bedroom at night, uh, but it can also occur outside. Uh, may be followed by an abduction, may not be. May be followed by an abduction, but they can't remember it because the memory's been fully blocked out. But he'd wake up frightened and he'd hide under the covers. He, 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 he sensed there was something bad going on in the room. Pull the covers up over himself, didn't like it at all. Note that means he wasn't paralysed. He was able to move his arms and, and everything. Uh, so in the end, he'd have to look. So he'd peep down above the covers. And there would be a being standing alongside the bed. That's the drawing he's tried to do of it. Uh, the being had this wide, oval-shaped face, and it had this strange olive-coloured-looking skin, kind of brownish, but he thinks it might have been lighter, like a tan colour, but because of the darkness of the, of the bedroom, it made it look more like that. He said its skin looked rubbery, almost like a puppet, uh, and it had a patch covering its left eye, like a pirate patch. Uh, and it's, it's, you can see it there. I know it's a bit hard to see, because obviously this one has got a large eye, but this one's covered in a patch. Let's look at figures of authority. So in some cases, the witness remembers the beings. Uh, they, they're human this time, but they exude some form of authority or power over them. Uh, so maybe a soldier or a police officer or something like that. And there you go. Examples include military soldiers, police officers, firemen, or just sometimes smartly dressed individuals. So kind of figures in sort of black smart suits. Now, of course, this may be responsible for some of the sightings of uh, so-called men in black. Now, men in black are a very real aspect of contact cases, and that's not, the, that's not the focus of my talk here today. But I've dealt with a number of cases involving men in black. Uh, some people believe that they are human and are doing some kind of surveillance, trying to learn more about the beings through the, uh, the experiences. Other people believe that they may be aliens themselves, uh, disguising themselves as humans. might be a mix of those two things, we don't know. But, and some of these incidents may also be the result of something called My Labs. Uh, hands up if you've heard of My Labs. Okay, quite a number of you, good. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, so uh, for those who haven't, my lab stands for military abductions. This is where people not only recall alien beings, so quite clearly non-human beings, such as greys, for example, uh, but they also see people in military uniform who appear to be working alongside these beings in some cases, uh, and sometimes they might just see the military, but they undergo an abduction-type uh, scenario. And uh, many, many believe that this implies that some areas of the military... Uh, are, are working in coherence with these beings towards common agendas. Again, I could do an entire talk just on that. Let's have a look at uh, some, uh, a case in soldiers. This is Bister. We're back now with the Bister contact case with Dave Hunt. And he, he had these repeated experiences between the ages of six and nine. And in this experience, 
what you'd see is several soldiers who appeared to be in uh, American military uniform would step out from his bedroom wall uh, in an uh, in area of light. And this is the wall here, this is the figures. That's him lying down in bed, and that's the figures. He's drawn the kind of arrow thing to show them walking around and standing alongside the bed. Uh, he, he was really frightened of this, obviously, uh, and too frightened to shout out for his parents. So these figures would just stand there and stare at him. Uh, and in the end, after a period of time, it would suddenly black out, and that would be the end of the experience. He never, they never touched him or took him out of the bed or anything like that. But, um, yeah, as I said, uh, the beings often uh, emerge from, uh, from walls or ceilings. Uh, this is a very probable screen memory. And we'll, we'll delve back into that, so remember that with the soldiers. Uh, we'll come back to that. Another one, Rachel's case. So, again, another case from, um, that we've already looked into, uh, the uh, Rachel's case in Erdington. Uh, she had a particular abduction experience that happened in the mid-1990s. And she was up, uh, this time she was away from her own home. She was uh, camping. Uh, she'd gone up to Scotland with her husband. She woke up in the middle of the night. So her husband's asleep next to her in a sleeping bag. Wakes up in the middle of the night, and she hears this strange sound. Uh, there's this growing white light coming from outside, and she thinks it's a vehicle driving around the campsite. She's wondering, why on earth is somebody driving around in the middle of the night? It's going to disturb the campers. And she initially thought it was a car. And she hears this strange whirring sound. said it was a bit like the noise of a helicopter, but there was no, uh, there was no air disturbance. So she thought it was a bit odd because the sound sounded quite loud and quite near. And she thought, why isn't the tent billowing around with this? So she decides to go and take a look. So she peeps outside the tent, and she sees there's two figures standing right outside her tent. There's a bright white light behind them, so she can't properly see their features. Uh, but they, she, can, she can see that they're wearing these dark bomber jackets and sort of smart trousers. And uh, she, uh, she gets out of there. They appear to all intent be human. And she gets out of the tent, and the, the men essentially kind of look her up and down. Um, she looks over to her right, and there's another uh, figure. There's a, there's a, a man, uh, apparently somebody else off the campsite, and he's looking bewildered at what's going on, and he just shrugs at her like this. At this point, she sees him go into a kind of trance-like state, uh, as I mentioned earlier on. So all of a sudden, it's like he's shut down, and she sees this beam come around him, and him start to lift up into the air in this beam of light. And then the same thing happens to her. Bang! White lights all around her. She feels this sensation of drifting upwards, blacks out. She then has memories of being in this small... Oval, uh, uh, sorry, um, dome-shaped room. It's kind of a dull metal colour. Uh, very, very cramped. Uh, that was the start of an abduction experience. I won't go into that because it's moving away from the element I'm talking about here. Uh, instead, let's move on to this, uh, something else that's seen, uh, clowns and carnage. I do apologise for the text going off the top. It's because I'm running it through a different PowerPoint and it's lost some of the fonts I had in there. Um, so, rather creepy picture of a clown there. So, yeah, there's numerous experiences on record where the, uh, the beings, uh, they, they can appear as uh, clowns or other carnival stuff. And I do apologise if any of you got a bit creeped out by, uh, by clowns at this point. I'm going to shut your eyes. Um, it can sometimes lead to a, an ongoing phobia of, uh, of clowns uh, later on in their life. And I'm not saying that every, anybody, everybody who's scared of clowns, because they look quite creepy. A lot of people are also scared of porcelain dolls and that sort of thing. It doesn't mean that they've been taken. It's just a, an after effect that can sometimes occur. So the craft can sometimes be recollected as circus trucks. Um, you don't really get circus helicopters or aircraft, do you? But, and again, this was actually referenced in Steven Spielberg's Taken. So we're going to go back now to an, another moment in it. This is just still from it, but this is a, uh, a travelling attractions truck. It was the same boy that saw the uh, squirrel earlier in his life. And but by this point in the, in the series, he's in teenage years, and he sees his circus truck go by and then experiences an abduction um, shortly after it. So again, Steven Spielberg, he looked into many of the elements that occur with the contact subject in great depth and showed them in the show, which is well, why I'm a personal advocate for how good that show is. Uh, so yeah, we're go let's go back to Rednor now. Remember the, uh, the repeat case in Rednor with the dream with the wolves? So after a while, the dream actually changed, and instead of wolves, he actually saw this giant face of a jester with a kind of long hat on with a bell on the end and, uh, and uh, you know, his pointed chin and everything. And he's tried to draw it there. That's his, that's his hat up here. Uh, his long, smiley mouth and this kind of hooked nose. Uh, and, of course, this is quite similar to uh, Punch and Judy. I found that picture online of Punch. Very, very similar there. You can see the similarity. 
Uh, so very interesting, this kind of clown-like features coming in there. And this is the same dream, it's just the, uh, the, the wolves changed into this jester face for whatever reason. Uh, and the rest of the dream remained largely the same, so this big floating face would essentially chase after him. He couldn't run away from it, and he'd black out. So we'll look at some uh, family members now. So sometimes the beings can appear as something recognisable to, uh, to, the, to the individual, uh, such as a relative or friend. And uh, it, it can sometimes be something else personal, such as a, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, a friend or a pet of the family, which links with the, uh, uh, obviously links between the animals thing and the kind of family link there. Uh, and the interior of the craft can sometimes be quite familiar to the person, so they might see it as their own home, for example, but there's usually kind of oddities that they'll spot. So maybe they might see their, their own room, but it, it look, the perspective's all off, like it's bigger than it actually should be, or maybe furnishings are in the wrong place, and so that sort of thing. Now, of course, you can easily have a dream where that happened, and I'm, I've I'm certainly had dreams where I've been in a kind of alternate version of my house. So I'm not saying that any time somebody has a dream like that, that it's not contact. I'm saying that the, uh, in cases with this, we know that the person's a contactee through their other experiences. And sometimes it's kind of led onto that, or we've, or we've examined it with regression, and that's found to be a screen memory. So we're back to the Droit Witch case now, and I'm going to take you back to the previous abduction experience, the one that happened about six days before uh, the one with the small doctor guy. Uh, so this was her first trigger abduction. Uh, and essentially, it started with a UFO sighting outside of, the, outside of the house, as a lot of experiences do. There is a direct link between contact and UFOs, and if anybody tells you that there isn't, they're wrong. Um, so she, uh, she found herself free-floating in this darkened area all around her. Very, very strange. There was these glowing yellow grid lines all around her in, in kind of cutting these surroundings into cubes. Very, very odd. And I've looked into uh, to see if I could find any other cases where that matched, and so far, uh, not specifically. That doesn't mean it didn't happen, of course. So she had this examination procedure by these uh, short beings that were all around her. She sensed that there were these short beings down along her sides, and they reached out, and she could feel them touching her body. This, uh, this time she was naked. She was flo floating in a lying down position, could not feel any kind of uh, bench or anything under her. But she was also paralyzed, so she couldn't really look around. She could look around her eyes a bit and move her head a tiny bit, but she couldn't look enough to see these beings, but she sensed... There was a lot of shorter beings around her, and there was also a tall one up there behind her shoulders. So in the distance, she's looking around like that, and she looks downwards, and in the distance, across the one side, she sees this white light all of a sudden appear in a rectangular shape, essentially a doorway opening into this darkened area. And standing in the doorway, she sees her son. Now, I met her son when I went around to see the family, and I had a chat with him. Uh, quite a tall chap, he was about seven foot high. Um, so really, really tall guy. And she saw him in her experience standing there in the doorway, and she remembered thinking, why on earth are you, you know, what are you doing in this bizarre experience? So she was very puzzled by that. Uh, and when she woke up after the experience, uh, she spoke with her son, and her son doesn't recall anything that happened with this. Um, he, he doesn't remember being there or anything like that. But under regression, um, which I'll take you now back to the regression that we did, she came up with these other details, and again, she saw past the screen memory. Now, this is a lady who, uh, she's got no bearing on the contact subject. She hadn't looked into contact before. The experiences for her were pretty traumatic, to be fair. So there's no chance that she kind of read this in a book and thought, I'm just going to make this up under regression. Uh, I believe that this is real information coming out from a real case. So somebody's standing in the light. It looks like my son. Your son is standing in the light. It's too tall. So here she goes. So she first sees what she consciously recollects, and then her brain, under regression, sees past it and starts to see what it actually is. It's too tall for your son? Yeah. How tall is your son? About six foot five. How tall is this thing standing in front of you? Seven, seven foot, eight foot. He has the features and the build of your son. Is that correct? No. He's very skinny. He doesn't have clothes on. How does he look facially? His face looks soft. He doesn't scare me. He's talking, but not with his mouth. I can hear him, but I don't know what he's saying. He's, wait, he's wanting them to hurry. He wants to know why I'm still here. He has big eyes, they're black, and he looks kind. So uh, you can see there that you see a, a, a tall uh, grey type being. Usually greys are usually about sort of three or four foot high, but sometimes very tall, very slender ones can also be seen. And some people uh, theorise that it's some kind of hierarchical uh, system with them. I wouldn't say I've reached that sort of conclusion just yet, although people who've had experiences may see that directly. 
Okay, so what did I mention? Towards the start, I mentioned this thing called silhouettes, didn't I? And I'm going to take you through what I mean by that now. So there's a number of cases on record where the beings are a recognisable shape, as in they may look like a being, uh, a grey being with a slender body, oversized, uh, you know, pear-shaped head, but they're kind of in shadow, so they see them as black, sort of flat silhouettes, essentially, with no features, with no distinguishing features, no facial features or anything. And in these cases, now obviously sometimes that might be because it's the middle of the night, yeah, and they can't really see clearly around their room. But there's a number of cases where they, they, they said that the beings were right next to the bed and they should have been able to see their facial features and couldn't. It's almost like they're, they're blocking out their facial features on purpose, so blocking out what they actually look like so they can just see a, a silhouette. Uh, and this is not to be confused with shadow beings, so some of you will have uh, heard of shadow beings. Uh, shadow beings link in, a, in a way to the uh, para, world of the paranormal, uh, but a lot of contactees have uh, reported seeing shadow beings, sometimes uh, in different experiences to seeing um, other ETs. Uh, so shadow beings are usually kind of very tall, uh, hooded, uh, robed, um, shadowy entities that will appear. Uh, sometimes they can see them at close proximity in, in visitations. Other times they might see them moving around their house or in proximity to them. Uh, it happens too regularly for it not to be a factor. It's a definite link there. Uh, other times the body of the figure is clear, but the face is shadowed or blurred, which is fascinating. There are some cases where they can see their body really clearly, but when they look up to their face, it's like their face is all edited out, it's almost like censored. Um, so it's, it's, it certainly implies that they're kind of blocking that so they can't see what they truly look like. Uh, can you see those clearly? Is that coming through? I hope that's coming through, okay. A couple of, uh, you can see the one on the right clearly enough. These, these two, they're just pencil drawings. Uh, this is from three completely separate cases. These people don't know each other. We've got a case in Leicester, Henley and Arden, and Huddersfield. And in all three of those cases, and this is just a fraction of the ones that I've got on record, by the way, um, you can see that the same thing's been reported. So they can see the outline of the being, uh, but, they, but it's, all, it's all in shadow, even when it's right next to them. They can't, they can't fully see it. So it's an example there, three cases, just to show this is a repeated thing. I'm not just talking about... And I'm never talking about something that's only ever happened in one case with this. Okay, so you've had a look there at a lot of the different types uh, of these screen memories. In the next part of my talk, we're going to move on to the various explanations that there may be for, for what's going on with this. There's quite a number of them. So what is going on with screen memories? They're either going to be something happening naturally, yeah, so internal to the person, or they're going to be something that's being done on purpose by the beings themselves. And you've got to separate that out. So we've got unintentional, so this is uh, things that are just happening naturally. Okay? Uh, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, see uh, the font again. So we're going to, we're going to look at, uh, because of the, uh, the, the, the situation, the trauma of the situation, we're going to look at something called archetypes, which not many of you have heard of before. Uh, and we're going to also look at altered perception or chemical changes in the brain as a possible explanation. And then we've got intentional uh, explanations. Memory overlay. So this is where the beings are doing this on purpose, disguising their, themselves. Uh, and also we'll, we'll look into physically shape-shifting. So let's have a look at our first possible explanation. And all of these should be entertained. They all have merit. Uh, so screen memories naturally occur as a result of the trauma of the situation. Well, this leads us largely back to the start of my talk, where I was talking about the scientific viewpoint for screen memories as a whole. So it's very new, various neurologists have highlighted the uh, element of psychological trauma underpinning the screen memory phenomenon. Uh, here's a couple of uh, quotes from that. Uh, the construction of the screen memory turns on the balance between memory and denial. The blocking of an unpleasant event, thought or perception is facilitated if some harmless but associated object can be substituted for the unpleasantness itself. The ego searches for memories that can serve as screens for the unpleasantness behind, which is thereby removed from consciousness. Quite a mouthful. That's from Otto Fensch and all these uh, psychometric theory of neurosis in, back in 1945. Uh, here's a, uh, another quote from Sigmund. Uh, they may be considered essentially defensive in nature. Their illusory aspect tends to infect all remembering, which thus may always be, always be suspected of having a screen function. Okay, so that's a couple of quotes there. There's many others you can find on record of people who've looked into this subject. So... Of course, for contact experiences, they can be extremely bizarre. 
to the person that's uh, undertaking them. There's non-human entities around them, very, very strange, unusual surroundings. Uh, usually very little communication. In some contact cases, the beings will hold in-depth discussions uh, with an individual. I won't go into that. I, again, I could go off on a tangent and talk about it for hours. But some people, they achieve a level of trust of the beings and they start opening up with them more and they'll have detailed discussions with them. But a lot of the time, they're very, very cryptic uh, and will just say a few words or they won't say anything at all, which can obviously be absolutely terrifying. Uh, they can uh, often do examination-type procedures using metallic instru instruments on the person and this sort of thing, touching them and that sort of stuff. And it, of course, that can be very, very frightening. So despite the fact that some contact experiences may be viewed in a positive light, a lot of the time they're quite nightmarish, especially when people first experience them. Sometimes they get used to them, and after a while they start to kind of see them uh, as a more positive uh, type thing. Uh, false memories can be recreated by the mind to help understand something or overcome fear. We've seen that from those uh, scientific quotes. So screen memories are more common in childhood years, and perhaps... This is because, as a child, these experiences are more traumatic because they, they, they can't entertain them with the real world. They, they're too young to have looked into UFOs and contact and that sort of thing. So they're just seeing this horrible stuff happen to them and they don't know why. So maybe that leads to a higher possibility of screen memories. Maybe. Something worth considering, isn't it? Sometimes screen memories are something frightening as well. We've mentioned a couple of cases where the, the wolves in the Rednall case or the spider in Southampton. Now, uh, Tina had a fear of spiders, of Uh She believes she had that fear before that experience. So had, they made, ha, had it been a spider because of that fear element, she'd remember something frightening to take the place of what was actually happening. Uh, possibility there. Uh, are the mem memories of authoritative figures also due to the control? So there's a lot of control. People are often shut down. They sort of can't do much to prevent what's going on around them. Uh, so does that lead them? Does that lead their mind to see them as some kind of authoritative figure, like a soldier or whatever, exuding some sort of control over them? Possibility. Let's have a look at reminiscence. Lovely picture of Barnell there. So in some cases, these screen memory replacing the beings is evocative of their actual appearance. Uh, so uh, an example of that is when you've got the uh, hospitals or doctors. Um, when people actually have uh, memories about being on the craft, a lot of the time the craft is kind of quite clinical. Uh, there's very little furnishings, smooth walls, and sometimes kind of no rivets or doors, this sort of thing. Uh, and does that immediately remind the mind of a kind of hospital-type environment? And that's why they see it as a hospital. Maybe. So in Bista case, both the uh, witnesses, they saw these pilots with dark shades on, didn't they, get out of the uh, thing? Were the dark shades actually black eyes? And that they remembered them as black shades because their mind was overlaying with, this, uh, with, with shades over the eyes. Uh, in the Leeds case, uh, the gentleman, Simon, he saw a pirate, didn't he, with a, uh, with a black eye patch? Or was that just its other eye? And he saw his eye as like an eye patch. And if so, why only the one instead of both? Uh, obviously, the both wouldn't have been able to see, would it? <laughs> so maybe that's why. So, uh, yeah, we've also got the similarity, of course, of an owl's face to a grey. The pale feathers with the dark eyes, and there it is, changing into a grey to show the similarity there. And baby barn owls, they look really creepy. I don't know if you've seen baby barn owls before, but I've got a uh, short video here, which hopefully will play, uh, with some baby barn owls. <laughs> Yeah, terrifying. I'm sorry, I agree. It's because, it's because they don't have all the feathers, so you know, adult owls have all the, all the feathers. It's kind of, but when they're young, they don't, they're very, very thin and, and it's kind of. Standing figures, really creepy. Let's have a look at pareidolia. So this is the tendency for incorrect perception of a stimulus as an object, pattern, or meaning known to the observer. Uh, it's derived from this Greek word called para, which is alongside an idolon, uh, image or form. Uh, it's a subcategory of something known as apophenia, and this is the tendency to mistakenly perceive connections and meaning between completely unrelated things. Uh, it's very common to see figures or faces in uh, patterns of light and shadow. Uh, countless times over the years I've been sent um, image, uh, photographic images where people are like, I've captured an alien being. 
And when you look at it, it's really just light and shadow, but they can see kind of faces in it and this sort of thing. You've got to remain on the ground with this subject. Otherwise, you just go down the rabbit hole. It used to be used as a sign of psychosis. So in the past, they actually thought this was a sign of, that the person was mad, but it's now compl- considered completely normal. And I guarantee each and every one of you will have had uh, episodes of pareidolia uh, throughout your life. Uh, a well-known example is, of course, the man in the moon. So uh, we've got the, that's the normal moon there, and there, here's the uh, highlighted facial features of the moon. It's not a face in the moon at all. You know, it's just, uh, it's just oceans, uh, dried out oceans on the moon's surface, areas of darkened rock and lightened rock, and, and that's all. But we see a face in it, don't we? And so I've got some other great examples of pareidolia here, some of which you may have seen before. Uh, these are absolutely stunning. So, can you see the face there? Yeah, look into the left, you can see the face. Some people say it's uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ, maybe. Uh, that, yeah, but you can see there's this bearded figure, can't you, with the hair and the eye and the nose and the mouth and everything. But that's not, that's, not a, uh, that's not a figure, that's not a face at all. What you're actually looking at is a baby sitting on a man's knee. <laughs> that there's the baby's face. It's wearing a white hat, and it's, and it's in white. And that's his arm there, just about, you see it there. And it's sitting on a man's knee. But to all intents and purposes, when you first look at that picture, you're like, that's a bearded man's face. Looking to the left, absolutely stunning. <laughs> it's just a cloud. It is just a cloud. A very, a very, very good, uh, a very, very good example of pareidolia. Yeah. This one's really creepy, and you may have seen this before. It's, sorry about the c- poor quality, by the way. It's an old picture, but up here you can see there's this horrible, uh, spectre-like uh, being with a kind of skeletal face, skeletal screaming face that appears to be kind of reaching out and touching the woman's shoulder. That is, in fact, bushes behind the woman. There's absolutely nothing there, but but it looks really, really creepy, doesn't it? And that's been passed around as a real uh, picture of a ghost. <laughs> no prizes there. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Huh? Yeah, it's just an elephant here. But doesn't it look just like a face? <laughs> yeah, I won't say all that it looks like. <laughs> but there we go, it's just a tree. So this is also linked with the uh, Rorschach test, a psychometric examination of the pareidolia phenomena. And you, many of you will have heard of this before. It's named after creator, Swiss psychologist Herman Rorschach. Uh, and it's, it's in a test where they put ink blots on a page in random shapes, and then they ask the person what they, what they see in the shapes. Uh, and it's, uh, it's deemed to work out their personality uh, or their emotions and that sort of thing uh, from what they, uh, what they see in it. Uh, so they've used this on um, sort of various uh, serial killers and this sort of thing before. Uh, so that's a uh, very famous uh, one of the, um, of the Rorschach tests. So, yeah, what do you see in that? It's all... Uh, uh, if, you, if you have a, a close look, you might pick out all sorts of things. And I'm not going to analyse you or tell you what your personality is based on what you're saying. But later on, if you see something in that, come and tell me after. So, oops, sorry, we missed a bit there. There we go. Yeah, well, neither reminiscence on pareidolia are going to be entirely responsible for the screen memories. Absolutely not. Uh, they may play a part in determining what's actually uh, seen, what's actually remembered from those experiences. So let's have a look at another explanation here. Screen memories are naturally derived from something known as archetypes. This is a very very unusual theory. Uh, Universal images or symbols that are derived from the conscious, uh, from the collective unconscious of the human race. Okay, so certain scientists theorize that information is passed down from generation to generation, and when you're born, you 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 have this uh, within you from from the off. Innate, unspecific knowledge derived from human history and inherited through human evolution. It's a a theory that was proposed by the psychoanalyst Carl Jung. Uh, Archetypes may affect conscious experiences or recollection of those experiences. These images must be thought of as lacking in solid content, hence as unconscious. They only acquire solidity, influence, and eventual consciousness in the encounter with empirical facts. Now, this is a very, very controversial theory, and uh, there's a lot of scientists who, who don't uh, acknowledge this as a real thing. So I'm not saying this is definite, but again, we've got some interesting links with contact. Uh, two of the most well-known recurring archetypal images are something known as the trickster and the shadow. And could these be linked with the, with the clowns that people sometimes see, or these silhouettes that are seen, these kind of dark shadowy forms with screen memories? I've got a bit of information about them. As a trickster, is a character 
In a story, he exhibits a great degree of intellect or secret knowledge and uses this to play tricks on, on individuals. And you can see he's in a hat there, just a hat again. Similarities. Uh, then you've got the shadow, which is supposed to be one's dark side, aspects that exist, but which one does not acknowledge or which, which one does not want to wish to identify with. It's kind of everybody's kind of dark side to them or whatever. Now, it's, it's interesting, the, the correlations there between some of the things that, that occur with contact. So is that the explanation? We don't know. Uh, explanation. Screen memories naturally occur as a result of altered perception or chemical changes in the brain. So it's very unreasonable and, and also unrealistic to assume that contactees in general are mentally unwell. Yeah. Many of them now, obviously, a lot of contactees they have experiences and they don't go and get tested down their GP. They just have these experiences. Yeah. But many have been tested over the years and have been found to be absolutely fine, absolutely sound of mind. Evidence which suggests uh, people experience contact, the state of perception is altered. Now, this is very, very common indeed, yeah. They'll often act in a very, very unusual way. They won't act how they would normally act when they're awake. So people react over-complacent to what's happening in the experience. And this is why we hardly have any photographs or videos of, of contact taking place. So a lot of the time, skeptics will say, OK, if this is going on all over the place, why don't contactees just grab their phone and take a photograph of the beings as they're being taken? And this is why, because when they're in the experience, they don't act normal. They don't think, oh, I'm going to get my phone and take a photo or anything like that. They just go along with what's happening. It feels very familiar to them in a lot of, a lot of time. Uh, back to that drawing, which case I mentioned it started with the UFO. phone. This is a drawing she's done of it. It was just this bank of lights, essentially. But it came up outside the house, really close, about 100 yards away. And yet she just accepted it and went back to bed. And this is before the experience happened. So perhaps this state that occurs, maybe it's natural, and maybe it's caused by the proximity of these beings or their craft. You know, maybe they're, they're affecting our, our brains in a certain way. So when people have contact up close, this happens and they act complacently. So perception creates a hypothesis of what you see based on sensory information passed to the brain. So every, th every single thing that we see around us on a day-to-day -day basis, it's all just what your brain is telling you is there with electrical signals. And optical illusions are an absolutely great example of that. So the brain decodes what it sees, and it sees sometimes sees something different to what is actually there. I've got a fantastic example here. <laughs> this is uh, this is last year in Paris. Uh, we went to a, uh, an optical illusions uh, museum in Paris, and you can see them apart in the tash. Uh, looking absolutely ginormous alongside me and me looking tiny and terrified. Uh, that is just the, uh, that's the shape of the room that we're standing in, with, which creates that illusion. Uh, absolutely powerful as anything. She loves that picture, I don't know why. Um, so under an altered state of perception, it may be possible for the brain to perceive incorrect memories. So is, is that another natural explanation for what's happening? Let's have a look at uh, chemical changes. So there's a variety of psychedelic substances and medications that are out there that are known to produce uh, very, very strong visual hallucinogenic effects. Uh, so perhaps when the individual's in close proximity to these beings or their craft, there's natural chemical changes that, that change, uh, and, and these, this starts in the brain. These changes could possibly cause altered memories to occur in certain circumstances. And uh, maybe, there's an, maybe some people have a natural to tolerance towards this. And maybe... The people who have a natural tolerance see the beings in their actual form, and the people who have screen memories are not tolerant towards it, and it affects them. Just a thought, isn't it? So in 1935, the French philosopher Jean-Claude Sartre, he experimented with a drug known as mescaline, uh, and he documented it over a period of weeks and how it changed his visual perception for a long period of time after he'd taken it. Uh, and he would see clock faces as owls, as owl faces in a uh, sort of grandfather clock, uh, so very, very interesting. There's a link there with contact again, isn't it? It appears linked with reminiscence of pareidolia. So some scientists believe that hallucinations may occur as a result of superimposing predictions on the world around them. So let's have a look at the other side of the coin now, where the beings are actually doing this on purpose. So an explanation, first of all. Screen memories are employed directly by the beings themselves. So the beings may look into the individual's mind and go fishing for ideas, essentially, for how they're going to project themselves. And that's, that could be why many screen memories are something recognisable to the individual. So, for example, the, uh, the Casper the Ghost and Elmer Fudd thing, he recognised those cartoon characters as a child. So uh, there's a number of different possible reasons for, for why that might be happening. Uh, the first is uh, potentially to reduce the trauma 
of the situation, uh, so just to make the, the experience less frightening to the individual when they remember it back later on. Uh, to prevent the consultee from panicking or retaliating, so if they see something that's familiar to them, they're less likely to lash out. And there's actually contact cases on record where people have found that they could move in the experience and they have actually struck the beings. Just gone at them. And the other one down there has gone off the bottom of the screen, but it's to maintain this covert agenda. So it's quite obvious to researchers that this is being done covertly. Contact is... Uh, otherwise, they would land all over the place and there'd be no question about this subject being real. They're not doing that. It shows they're acting covertly. And it's my belief why uh, many, many of the experiences occur in either very rural locations or in the middle of the night is directly linked with that. They don't really want to be seen. But if somebody does randomly see them, they don't, they don't seem to mind too much. So missing time, it also occurs in the majority of contact cases, at least partially. So is this also employed by the beings for the same reason, to block out the memories, to reduce the fear of the situation, to maintain this covert agenda? Uh, the cases where the craft are seen at a distance. So you think, if you're seeing a craft up in the sky, hundreds of feet away or whatever, what's so frightening about that? And yet people still experience uh, distant uh, screen memories. They may see a, a plane in the sky or a, 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 a very strange... Uh, I, I dealt with one case where he'd seen a red biplane, sort of World War I biplane, and he's thinking, what on earth is that? And later on, it turned into an abduction. Uh, so there's other cases where the individual is not afraid of the UT, so again, you've got the, uh, the, the no fear element there. Examples when the contactee is aware that the beings have intentionally changed their appearance, like the Australian case there, he's making himself look like Casper and Elmer Fudd. So the individual was aware that the being was changing its appearance on purpose. Uh, there's cases where the beings are directly confirmed that they're the thing that the contactee is seeing them as. <laughs> and that's a, big, a bit of a mouthful there. Okay, here's an example with the Droitwich case. This is back to the regression. So Jenny says, I know that he's not what he says he is. What does he say he is? Tell me, what does he say he is to you? A doctor. Does he verbalise he's a doctor? Yeah. So the being itself told her that it was a doctor. So it, it, it actually spoke with her silent tone. So it, was kind of, so it wasn't just a visual perception of her mind. It was actually trying to be a doctor. Uh, many examples of potential memory phishing in the cases covered uh, today. You've seen the pet dogs. Um, ah, I, I say pet dogs in Bletchley. I'm oh, sorry, I did cut that one down. Uh, he saw his own pet dog in that one. The soldiers, the son aboard the craft in Droitwich. So let's have a look at our last explanation here before I move uh, quickly on to the um, uh, conclusions and a few other little bits and bobs. So this is that the, uh, the beings are actually physically shape-shifting. So many people believe that the ET species known as the reptilians have the ability to shape-shift, actually shape-shift, not project an image, but actually shape-shift into human form. I've dealt with a number of cases where that exact thing has occurred, and I'm not talking about government takeover here, I'm talking about contact cases that have that aspect in them, and I'm going to show you one of them in just a minute. So there's cases where the contactees have witnessed this directly. There's many cases where UFOs have been seen to change shape as well. So people have seen craft at a different distance. Sometimes that can be a different angle, but other times they appear to have actually changed shape. Potentially, they may still explore the mind of the contactee to aid in deciding which shape they're going to take. Uh, but the, uh, the, uh, there's another phenomenon known as walk-ins, where the individual will... Other, other people in the surroundings will actually see the person's visual appearance change, or they might see it in a mirror, and they might see themselves as a grey, for example. So that could also involve physical shape shifting there. Uh, so there's a repeat case I dealt with from Wakefield in 2013, and um, uh, the man on this property in Turkey. And one night, he, he wakes, there's a presence in the room. He rolls over in bed, so again, he's not, he's not paralysed. Starts with this dim light. And he rolls over, and there's a man lying down alongside him on the bed, um, propped up on his arm. <laughs> Bizarre. Eh? And he immediately knew that it, it wasn't right, you know, it's just what on earth. So he knew because of his previous contact experiences that this was a, a grey, uh, not a grey, sorry, a being masking its appearance and not appearing as it was. And it, it essentially, he got angry at it. He said, Why have you come to me as a human? You are not what you appear to be. If you return, come in your natural form. He blacks out, experience carries on, so later on later he wakes again, and what he sees is a couple of uh, reptilian-looking eyes staring right at him uh, up close with the uh, vertical slits, and then we could see just the bridge of the nose, very, very close to him. And he, he absolutely felt certain this was the same being. Uh, and the, the eyes kind of leapt towards his face, and then he immediately blacks out because of it. Interesting correlation there with the spider leaping towards uh, Tina, so you'll see correlations all over the place with this subject. So he woke again a third time, and now he sees an image of its arm. It was almost like it was allowing him to expect 
it for, some, for whatever reason. It was holding its arm out and he could have a look at it. You could see all the green scales down it. And he finally dropped off and that was, it. that was the end of that experience. So you've seen there a lot of different explanations for, for contact. I'll briefly go through some conclusions and I said I had a couple of little extra bits at the end to finish off. So, while they don't always occur, screen memories, they're clearly a valid aspect of the contact phenomena. I've dealt with many, many cases, some great examples you've seen today, lots of other cases as well that have this in. There's a wide variety of overlays that can occur, but a noticeable repetition of themes across the cases. Here's my personal opinion on what's going on with this. I think that in most cases, the screen memories are being done on purpose by the beings. And the reason I think that is that it's happening far too regularly for it just to be something random. I, I, I don't, there's many cases, even though there's a few cases where there's a lot of trauma involved, and I'm not saying that that's not entirely out of the question. So there may be some cases where trauma is the explanation or a contribution towards it, but I certainly believe that this is something being done on purpose by the beings. The existence of screen memories complicates the separation between real and imagined experiences because it's no longer just seeing uh, an alien. It's like you might see a family friend or your pet dog or something, and that could be a contact experience with a, with a screen memory. You would have to look at the experience as a whole and look at the other aspects to, to see that or not. So through ongoing study of this phenomenon, I believe we can lift the mask to reveal the truth beyond. So that's my conclusion on screen memories there. There's my uh, logo from my group, Birmingham UFO Group. We've got our website. All the cases you've heard of today, the uh, detailed case reports with witness drawings, everything can all be found on bufog.com. You can just go to the blog and all the reports are in there. You'll find literally hundreds of case reports that I've written over the last 14 years in there. Not all the cases I investigate have case reports, only if the witness allows me to write one. Uh, and some of them have got edited details, that sort of thing. We've also got Bufog Truth Seekers. That's our Facebook, uh, that's our Facebook page. You can add yourself to that. So, now, briefly, we've got about seven minutes left. Here's something completely different. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you all to a UFO Wave. So if you haven't heard of this, for a number of years now, I've been working on a card game, a card game directly themed on the UFO subject. Uh, it's got wonderful cartoon artwork that's been done by an actual abductee from New York. Uh, he has done the artwork for the game. Uh, I, I chose him on purpose because of his experiences and because I just loved his art style. Uh, I decided to take the game. I could have taken it down a very serious route or a kind of more fun cartoony route. I took it down the latter. I wanted it to be uh, more approachable, especially for people who particularly didn't have an interest in the contact subject or the UFO subject, uh, and they would get it as well. It's also family-friendly, so it's made for older kids. I've got a 10-year-old daughter who absolutely loves playing the game. She's actually beaten, that, uh, beaten it at me a couple of times. Uh, now, we're launching the game via Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a crowdfunding website, and essentially you back the game in, a, in, in the launch period, and then if enough people back the game, I collect the funds, I then get the game manufactured, it gets shipped out. We're aiming to get it shipped out to everybody by Christmas uh, uh, this year, and um, it's going to be about sort of £20 sort of mark, uh, or 35 with a playmat. I've actually got one of the prototypes of the game here with me today and the prototype playmat. Uh, so later on today, if you want to see it physically or even have a game, you can actually try, try it out. But the website is there, ufowavegame.com. We're launching on Kickstarter at 12 o'clock on Thursday, the 29th of July. And it will be, uh, the Kickstarter will go until the 28th of August. I'm putting a lot of, uh, a lot of money on it being a success. I need the UFO community and the gaming community to get behind this. Uh, I absolutely believe it's the most authentic portrayal of the UFO subject ever in any board or card game. Uh, so do go check it out. And we've got a lovely uh, grey mascot called Bob as well. Uh, so an animated advert and all sorts of stuff to enjoy. Last five minutes now. Here we go. Again, something different. Something else I'd like to introduce you to is this, ISA, the International Coalition for Extraterrestrial Research. Now, ISA has been uh, planned for a number of years, and I have been chosen as the Deputy uh, United Kingdom Deputy Representative. Uh, ISA is a, an international company, as it says in the title, uh, with representatives from 27 countries across five continents at the moment. Uh, and it's a, a mix of scientists, academics, and UFO researchers. Uh, we have, uh, let, me, let me take you through some things about ISA. So first of all, this is a, uh, a map. I don't know if you can see that clearly from where you're sitting. But essentially, this is a, an overview of it. 
Uh, we've got our president. The president of ISA is Roberto Pinotti. He's got over 50 years' experience in investigating UFOs. Uh, uh, lives in Italy. So he's the president. Gary Hesseltine, who many of you will know from the UK, is the vice president of ISA. And he, uh, he's the one who cho uh, he chose me, reached out to me a number of months ago to be the deputy for the United Kingdom. And we've got Donald Schmidt across in the States, the leading expert on the Roswell crash. Uh, we've got Suzanne Hansen, contactee and absolute expert researcher from New Zealand. Francesco Carrera is uh, in charge of the uh, Continental Director for Europe. Um, we've got uh, there's a space there for Asia. Uh, lots of other countries involved. A.J. Javad from Brazil, and again, a very famous name in the world of ufology. So absolutely fantastic people on board with this. We've all taken an, I an oath, and this is an oath that I had to sign on when I joined ISA, and this is the oath. I affirm it is my personal belief that an extraterrestrial or non-human intelligence is interacting with planet Earth. The UFO UAP issue is complex, but it is important to acknowledge now that it is real and acts with intelligence. My belief is based on both physical, i.e. radar, film, photographic and trace evidence, and the testimony of highly qualified eyewitnesses from around the world. Furthermore, I am prepared to state this publicly. So that's what we all had to sign when we joined ISA. This is what bands us together, and this has never been done before to the scope that we're doing with ISA, this international as aspect of it, and the fact that we've all taken this oath. So there's a number of different goals of ISA. At the moment, there is minimal public awareness on the reality of this subject. Obviously, most of you here in the room you know, are on board with it. Many of the public are not, of course. ISA aims to change all that over time in a variety of ways. We're putting together at the moment familiarization programs in wake of the, uh, the, the report, the preliminary re uh, report that went out in the US, that uh, some of you will be aware of, uh, and that will inform different sectors of society as to the reality of this subject. We're going to research the very best evidence for both historic and new cases that, uh, that, that come out and highlight details of this evidence to the public. We're developing educational courses uh, designed to explore the subject in depth and enlighten people of various age groups, so not just adults, but also educational courses for children. And we aim to take this to the highest levels of governance. We will take this as high as we can, even to the United Nations, if, if, if time allows. This is the uh, vision, the vision scope of ISA for planet Earth's humanity living in conscious harmony with cosmic intelligences. So you can see there that we're all on board with this being real and most likely extraterrestrial in origin. And now, here to end... Coalition to ISA, the International Coalition for Extraterrestrial Research. The phenomenon of the UFO, or UAP, a valenza mondiale ed è stato investigato per oltre 70 anni. And it may have profound implications for humanity and society. Esto actúa con inteligencia, probablemente extraterrestre y de origen no humano. Die Frage ist also, wie sollen wir mit diesem Phänomen umgehen? Fue por isso que fundamos a ICER a coligação internacional para a investigação extraterrestre. ISA currently has representatives in 27 countries on five continents. We are scientists, academics and leading UFO, UAP researchers around the globe. Und wir finden, es ist an der Zeit, dass wir uns auf diesen Kontakt vorbereiten. Seriously. And the time is now. Y es por eso que Eiser está tratando de sentar las bases para una nueva realidad. Nós estamos juntando o máximo de informação possível sobre todos os aspectos deste fenômeno. Eiser is creating awareness programs to help people prepare for this new reality. El Eiser vuole promover relaciones pacíficas con esta inteligencia. Aceasta este o cale de descoperire pentru întreaga omenire. Cómo queremos dar forma a nuestro futuro? Let's think about it. Well, there we go. My name is David Hodrin, Birmingham UFO Group Chairman. Thank you very much for your time.
Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Dave, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Absolutely brilliant. And um, I... <laughs> Hello, our <well>, contact. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I want to say, I so are very lucky to have you as part of their team, and you, you'll be an asset to them, definitely. Is much further ahead technologically than us, mm. and they found that sending machines out to do their space travel and one thing and another just never worked. Yes. So what they had found, perhaps without really what, realizing what it really means, because we're all part of everything, and I remember at school in the 60s, some scientist mixing pig ovum with human sperm, and it started to develop. There was an outcry, and so he destroyed it. But these people have gone much further. So what they've been doing is they have been taking human, animal, plant, all kinds of things, mixing with the patterns in nature and producing these creatures. And really, all this is very interesting, but it is disgusting. Mm. Because every lifetime you have, you get another layer of brain cells. It makes us more complex, more thoughtful, more compassionate. These creatures have no compassion. They have no, they think in straight lines. They know that they haven't got, the whole idea has been, you create them, you remove their genitalia, and they don't, they don't have sex. So they think they have no souls. Well, possibly they don't. And you notice here, all, all down your note, this is all your chakras and another, uh, you know, another channel for your autonomic nervous system, which makes your third eye, which passes down your spine to your, to your base chakra. Your ears are a whole map of your body. They have no noses. They have no ears. So they are these creatures, so they're trying to mix themselves with us so that they can, I mean, the whole thing is a nightmare, actually. And in fact, it, well, it's very interesting, but we should be furious, yeah. really. But, yeah, a lot, I mean, a lot of people see the very negative side of the abduction phenomenon, the, uh, the lack of uh, consent, uh, because these beings are certainly aware that, they, that we can communicate with them. They know that we can speak back. So it's not the same as, as looking at, say, a rat in a lab or something like that, because we can't talk directly to the rat, yeah. they know that they've got a direct communication link. Now, the, the reason for that lack of consent, we, we don't really know. And we don't really know the true relationship between them and us. And I'm not saying, you, know, you may you know, believe you worked that out, and that's absolutely fine. There's all sorts of uh, different opinions on the subject. And they, they may feel that they've got the right to do this, or they may view us as such a lower form of life compared to them, that, you know, that they feel that they can just do that. Uh, you know, without asking for our consent. So it's one of the ongoing problems of the contact phenomena. Yes. Yes. No, well, no, I mean, I'm, no, absolutely not. But to the beings, they may see us as that. We're talking about non-human things. Um, so. I think that this conversation could be definitely had over a drink <laughs> oh, yeah, and some food. And as I said, Dave's here. Dave, as he very rightly said, is here all day, happy yep. to have discussions. I think this, this has set the tone for the day. There's a, lot, there's a lot that has been sparked in people. Myself as well, I've had some very similar, well, not similar, I've had some of those experiences. Yep. So, yep. yeah, a lot to talk about. But lunch is, is be coming out shortly. The weather's kind of brightening up. But I don't